You are listening to the 21st broadcast of TBR Radios, the TBR History Hour, with your host, TBR contributing editor, Dr. Edward DeVries. In today's show, Dr. Ed calls retired Alabama State University professor, Dr. Kirk Wood. Dr. Wood explains the origins and causes of the war between the states, and why all of the isms, plaguing modern America, are European in origin. Dr. Wood explains the true meaning of federalism, why many who signed the Declaration of Independence opposed the Constitution, and how the government of America's founding was in some part lost at Appomattox. Yet, despite the loss of such important doctrines such as secession and nullification, Dr. Wood believes that the current pandemic crisis shows us that at least some parts of our Constitution are still working as the founders intended. Of course, I'm into history and uh, constitutionalism, but interestingly, the Bible was very much an issue in the Civil War. Of course, the South was for the Old Testament. I mean, for Trinitarian Christianity, you know, for regular Orthodox Christianity. All those Northerners were really uh, kind of pseudo-Christians, liberal Christians, I guess you could say, Unitarians. They were anything but Trinitarians, and it's quite a difference, you know. And that's why they that's why they could uh, be in favor of abolition. The other book, you know, the other text, the Bible, was in the thick of the background. Did you read the book? And I haven't, I'll confess, I haven't read the book in 15 years, and so my memory of it's going to be very fuzzy. But Frank Connor had written a book uh, a number of years ago, and it was called The South Under Siege, 1830 to 2000. And he, oh, yeah, yeah. He, he broke it down into theological terms, and I, I thought that that was just a brilliant, a brilliant piece when I read it. Well, it was. It's, it's, the, it's the Orthodox Christianity versus the, the Reform religions of the 19th century North, who, who were romantic perfectionists. You need to take a look at uh, Eugene Genovese on the mind, of the, the mind of the master class. He goes into Southern history and theology. He said that at least the South, the South was right about the, uh, the, the South was right about the Bible. You don't find that in too many works. Well, the best that I can determine it. The South still believed in a God-inspired Bible. Yeah. And in yeah. the North, they did not believe in a divinely inspired Bible, and and that yeah, was right. the difference ultimately in the way they interpreted it. Yeah. Well, it's a complex story, but because of Germanic rom- uh, romanticism in the North is basically Rousseau, but it comes by way of Germany. And of course, they get the higher criticism of the Bible. That's mm-hmm. all. That all infected the North. All the Yankee schools, Ivy League schools, all their school divinity schools. It's quite a quite a history. So I've not had the benefit of reading your book, Beyond Slavery: The Northern Romantic Nationalist oh, yeah. Origins of yeah. the Civil War. Is is this the the primary theme of your book, or is this just something that's that's just a small portion of a larger work? Beyond slavery, uh, the Northern Romantic Nationalist origins of the Civil War is really the preface and introduction to Volume One of Six. I've now I've now done five volumes and probably at least one more to go. But I have five volumes beyond slavery, the Northern Romantic origins of the Civil War of America's Civil War. It's the North that changed and not the South. They wanted to perfected nation, and perfection was, the final perfection was nationalism. we got to unify the states. Well, would that be nationalism, or would that be, yeah. uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Because when I think of nationalism, I, I think of, okay, a nation is defined in the Bible, and I understand that, you know, not everybody thinks in biblical terms, but well, a nation na- is, is defined in the Bible is the Greek word was ethnos. And yeah. so, you know, it's people who share an ethnicity, they share a language, they share, you know, a common culture, a common faith. You know, there's a lot of commonalities there. So I could make the argument that the United States ceased to be a nation even before the war between the states, that, that it's been an empire, at least since the presidency of Jefferson. Well, an empire is a whole different question. Mm-hmm. The extended republic, this 
the extended republic is not a nation. So for a nation, you need to have one single government, not a federal system. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. Uh, nationalism was about uniformity in America. Get rid of slavery, make everybody into a Puritan. It was about hate and change. So Lincoln and the Republicans were about making America like the, like the, like the New North. Re the Reconstruction of America was not against just the South. It was against the Plains Indians. So that war was also ongoing in the 1860s. Well, it, was about, it was about uniformity and politics. Well, I understand that things can be good and things can be valuable and a tool can be useful. And then at some point then, when you've done the job, you put it in the box <laughs> and you go to the next tool. Yeah. But, you know, nationalism then, according to the powers that be at the time of the war between the states, nationalism good. Now nationalism is bad. <laughs> And so, well, is it, it a is. tool that I guess served its purpose, and now they've discarded it? Uh, you know, explain that to me. Well, nationalism in the North by Lincoln and the Republican Party turned into imperialism. That was the na mm -hmm. that was nationalism extended abroad, and that's all because of that mm -hmm. Republican Party, which had nothing to do with uh, freeing the slaves, despite what Trump says. <laughs> you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So it was about the political unification making the government one, uh, discarding the idea of a right of revolution in the Declaration. South seceded, Lincoln wouldn't acquiesce in peaceable, peaceful secession. Well, you know, this week, uh, another radio host disappointed me grossly this week, and that was Sean Hannity. Oh. And, uh, you know, he was basically rebuking those in Michigan who dared to show up at their state house armed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, he said, you're putting the lives of, of police in danger. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's like telling the patriots at Lexington, you know, not to show up at Lexington Green with a gun because they might, they, they might yeah. put one of the king's soldiers in danger. Well, th this is postmodernism <laughs> and political correctness. This is anti-history, anti-science. Oh, anyway, postmodernism. It's anti-history, particularly. It's anti-Constitution. It's anti-Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. But just the reason I even bring that up is because, you know, the Constitution gives us the right to yes. petition our government for the redress of grievance, but it doesn't define how we have to do that. That's a very open, uh, yeah, well, you know, thing. Yeah. And, and like... Like you said, there was a right of revolution in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution because, you know, our founding fathers, they tried everything. They, they had petitions. They wrote, had right. writing campaigns. They had lobbying campaigns to That's Parliament. Right. They sent yeah. delegates to the king. And when nothing else worked, they started shooting people. Yeah, so that's why uh, we, we at least had John Locke. The appeal to heaven was you start a, you, st you secede. Right. We seceded from the, literally seceded from the British Empire for self-government. The and colonies want to control over their internal affairs. That, that, that's the state sovereignty of the Confederation. Yeah. Each state was sovereign and independent, and that was the first federal, that was our first federal government. Mm -hmm. The first extended republic, long before Madison. Well, you yeah, know, you... right of revolution. That that ends with the Civil War. Yeah. Well, that's, I guess, what I'm getting at is you hit on something really hard there is that, you know, the biggest threat to the government that our patriot fathers established was that their children or their grandchildren or their great grandchildren might decide to do the same thing that they did. You know, obviously, you know, our Southern uh, fathers did. And the thing that I find interesting is only 80 years had passed. Yeah, it's, yeah. What, 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 not quite 100 years. That's right. Yeah. In fact, there was, I, I can't remember the gentleman's name now, but he was actually serving in, in Washington's army as like a six-year-old. Well, it could be, yeah. And wow. he, I mean, he wasn't a soldier. He wasn't fighting, obviously, but yeah. he was traveling with the army. He was traveling with the camp because he was an orphan. He had nowhere else to go. You know, they took care of him, and he, he did, you know, little tasks in the camp or whatever, you know, helped him carry yeah. things well, and tote things and, and whatever. That's right. <clears throat> and. Well, 
And yet he was also doing the same thing as a man in his 90s in the Confederate Army. And so, uh, you know, in the lifetime of one man, you know, the the government, or even you put it in another context, Light Horse Harry Lee was was George Washington's right-hand man. And his very son, Robert E. Lee, had to take up arms to defend himself and his people from the very government that his father had fought to establish. Civil War was very much about 1776 and 1787. There are two different versions. There's the original one by the South and its northern allies. Don't forget the northern allies. They believed in original intentions. Lincoln and the new Republican Party mm-hmm. and the Romantic Perfectionists did not. They were against original mm-hmm. intentions. Yeah. They also rewrote history to reflect their beliefs. So in the larger work, beyond the little book I had mm-hmm. published, uh, there's a, another title, Beyond Slavery, A New History for a New Nation in the Making. So not only did Romantic Perfectionism change the North, it also changed our history. So the 19th century beliefs of Lincoln and the Republicans were just transported back to the founders and framers to make them what they were not. And, of course, they identified the South with slavery. And that's the history we got from the Civil War. Unfortunately, the North won the Civil War, and they rewrote the history, too. Open your web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine. In the Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review magazine in its print form, or in convenient electronic delivery. Our host has been a subscriber to both formats for years. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. So obviously, you're, you know, stating the truth here that slavery was not the cause for the war. But all of these years later now, why did slavery have to become the official cause? In other words, what were they covering up? The South's defense of original intentions, the Constitution, the Declaration. The Declaration was about independence, not equality. That's one thing that changes. 1776 was about independence, not the equal rights of men. The Constitution was not, did not create a nation. So the, the Lincoln and the Republic, the Lincoln and the Republicans have to legitimize their newer ideas. The South they knew were defending the, fa- the framers and the founders. Well, let's identify them with slavery. The Civil War was an irrepressible conflict between 18th century Republicanism and 19th century Romanticism. Okay, I- explain this for our listeners because you know you use a term like republicanism. And yeah. people automatically think of Republican Party. No. Kind of explain to people that back in this period, Republicans of that period were more like the Democrats today, and the uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. the, oh, yeah. the yeah. and people who believed in Republicanism would have actually, uh, you know, been Democrats back then. <laughs> well, the Republicans were not. First of all, when you say slavery is the cause of the war, the South wasn't about defending slavery. And abolition did not mean black equality. My God, the, whole, the, the, Link, the Lincoln and the Republican Party came to power 1856 to 1860 on free soil, free labor, free men. Whites in the territories only. No blacks wanted. Eric Foner's book, uh, Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, gets into the ideology of the Republicans. And they were as racist as anybody else. They didn't want the blacks. So they say Congress has the power to prohibit slavery. No, they don't. The the founders left it to the states to decide for or against. Only a state admitted into the Union could decide on the issue of slavery, not Congress. That's the cause of secession. The resistance to secession was one nation. We've got to get rid of disunionism. 
uh, slavery in the territories is the issue that brings on the war, and it was constitutional. You know, can you talk about slavery in the territories? You have places like Missouri and Kansas. Yeah. And, you know, you could make the argument that the war had actually started out there, if you will, or at least the division had started there, you know, Mm -hmm. years before states started seceding. Well, you had, oh, Lord, that's a lot of of history. (laughs) You know, bloody Kansas. That was uh, Southerners and Yankees on the borderlands. Southerners moving up, Yankees moving across the West. It was kind of like a civil war. What kind of constitution would a new state enact? Would it have slavery or would it not? It really made no difference because there were no slaves about to go into the territories. You know, I think in 1860 there were, what, six slaves in New Mexico? They did. They just were not, they were not, slavery was not going to expand any further than it had. Well, you could make the argument that the people who were moving westward into the territories, they were going there to get land grants, and the reason that they needed a land grant was because they couldn't afford to buy land where they were at, and if they couldn't afford to buy land, how were they going to afford to buy a slave? Of course. And, of course, the other thing, uh, the framers did ban the slave trade. The slaves in America, what, 400,000, about 1790, reproduced themselves to become almost 4 million. Nobody could predict that. But anyway, the short supply meant that the price of slaves was reaching a point where nobody could afford to buy one. So the high price of slaves would have had something to do with the amelioration of slavery. You know, it's funny you talk about the high price of slaves. If, if you were to think of slaves in terms of farm implements, you know, tractors and farm <clears throat> implements are becoming yeah. so expensive now that the farmers can't afford them. And not only that, they're they're going back to these old 1970s and 1960s tractors, not only because yeah. they can't afford the new ones, but because they can work on the old ones. Yeah, that's right. And so was, was the raise in the price of slavery, was that, uh, because a lot of things are, are driven by the government to drive a, to drive a social agenda or a political agenda. Yeah. In other words, what, was was there some underlying government force that was pushing up the price of slaves to to try no, to? No, it was it was just you can't get any more from Africa. The world had gone more uh, anti-slavery and abolition. Most of the world had become abolitionist by then, so there was no there was no supply. And at some point in time, unless the birth rate kept up, there would have to be something done about slavery. You would have to, you know, you would have to transform the labor supply. Now, of course, the other thing about the territories is, if Lincoln and the Republicans weren't egalitarians, what about the black people? Well, Reconstruction in the South was to keep them there, elect, put in black elected officials for safe Republican votes to continue the economic policies of the Republican Party, all of which were enacted in the early part of the war, when the South was out of the Union. Well, after the war, well, let's have, let's have more states and make them Republican, safe Republican votes for a continuing Republican majority for the economic agenda. So from the best that I can tell, there really wasn't a hatred amongst most Southerners for blacks, and there really wasn't a hatred amongst most Southern blacks for, you know, white Southerners. What we know is of as racism or racial tension or whatever seems to have been a creation of the Yankees post-war is these black people were being put into these positions that they knew were, were out of their place. They had to know that they were being used. In other words, they had to know that army that had just invaded them and had just ravaged what had been their home as well mm-hmm. couldn't have their best interest in hearts. It certainly they had to be more intelligent than that. How and why did these black people allow themselves to be used basically by their enemy, not only against their former masters, but even against their own best interests? Well, they thought they could help the, the, the black people in their states, number one, but they wanted power like everybody else, you know, black governors, the black congressmen. So the quid pro quo was we vote Republican in the congressional and presidential elections, and if we need you in the, from Washington, 
we'll call on you. But in the meantime, we'll, we have enough support to maintain control. There were a lot of dynamics to that period, to the pre-war, the war, the re- and especially Reconstruction. Oh, yeah, Reconstruction is, I mean, my God, it's, it's hard enough to explain the Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> Reconstruction, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. All it meant for Republicans was there shall be no more legal ownership of, of humans as property. That was the end of their commitment. After this, they were back to the economic policies, the tariff, banking system, big business. So emancipation was about free labor, not about black equality. Now, the blacks had a little different view. They they wanted really more equality. So, you know, I guess my point in this is that, you know, these issues and the conversation of them, therefore, is a lot deeper than, you know, it was about slavery. Well, you got to, yeah, well, what slavery was. Now, that's another whole subject of of a a thousand books, what slavery was. Well, there was a black middle class. There's a a wonderful book by Professor Willard Gatewood at the University of Arkansas, The uh, (coughs) Black Aristocrats, Black Aristocrats, after after 1865. Well, where the hell did they come from? There was a black middle class in antebellum days in the urban areas. People forget about that. There were free blacks, you know, quite Mm -hmm. a number of them. And and even enslaved blacks, blacks, you know, some of them were, were, you know, getting cash bonuses from their masters, uh, you know, for extra production and productivity in the farms and in the factories. And, you know, they they had lines of credit in the stores just like white people did. And, you know, they carried guns, some of them. and Blacks owned slaves, too. Yeah. You don't hear about this. Mm -hmm. You, know, you never hear about that. Yeah. You know, they, you know, obviously, you know, those who, who took advantage of those incentives and who worked harder mm-hmm. and produced more and got the bonuses obviously had a, a higher standard of living than those who just did the minimum to, to get by. And yeah, I guess you so could say were, capitalism there, there even worked relations. for slaves. There were good relations between white, among whites and blacks in the South. Mm-hmm. Zora Neale Hurston writes about it. Well, well let me, let hear me. About, you don't ask hear you much a, about her either. So. Let me ask you a deep philosophical question. Oh, Lord. <laughs> okay. okay. So, so you, you're a slave in the antebellum period, and your master provides you with a house. Your master provides you with clothes. Your master provides you with food. Your master provides some kind of child care for your children until they're old enough to work. I mean, your master, you know, he provides you with food. Your master mm-hmm. provides you with health care. In fact, a lot of the slaves, uh, the doctors saw them more than they did uh, the white folks because, you know, if somebody got sick, the, the master only had so much money to pay the doctor. You know, mm-hmm. he would he would often want to keep the slaves working. And so the slaves got better health care sometimes even than the master's own family. And, of course, all this is provided by the master because you're a slave. And so now let's fast forward. Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Chuck Schumer, pick your Democrat. So the government provides us with a house. The government provides us with our food. The government provides us with health care because, according to them, it's a right. The government, uh, you know, takes care of the, uh, the our child care and education in schools for our kids. Uh, the government uh, gives us what they what they want to call a universal basic income. Yeah, but the but didn't the that just make want, us slaves? The Democrats want it for everybody. But that's they my point. For everybody. That's my point. Are they not just literally enslaving the whole country? What's the difference? No, that's how some you know. Socialism is enslavement because socialism mm-hmm. is not something nice. It's communism, totalitarianism. Well, that's my point. So while they're talking about how evil slavery was, why are they trying to enslave us all? Well, that's 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 largely an uh, abolitionist myth, Garrison fueling hatred between the sections. There there were some, you know, horrors to slavery and the slave trade, but that's life, too, you know? Oh, yeah, the modern Democrats, <laughs> they're the new plantation masters under the name socialism. Many years ago, when I was a pastor in Texas, Lady Bird Johnson was a member of one of the churches that I pastored. And so I had the uh, privilege on a few occasions of visiting with her 
there at the LBJ Ranch. Wow. She told me one time, because I, I asked her just one day, I just asked her about some things. I said, I'm not trying to be, I told her, I said, I'm not trying to be critical of you or your husband. I said, I'm just trying to put history in perspective. And her response to one of my questions was that her husband, though he would have never said this publicly, but that he had said it privately on a few different occasions and, and several mm-hmm. in her hearing, was that the whole war on poverty and the whole Equal Rights Act and the whole, you know, the whole, uh, the whole welfare system and everything was that they were just building a big plantation. <laughs> well. That they were just going to take all the... I'm not going to use the word because we'll get kicked off the radio. Yeah. But, yeah. but but yeah. they were going to take all the black folk and they were going to round them up and put them on one big government plantation. But they thought LBJ was their friend. Well, we, they didn't know all the intricacies of politics. Extra, extra, we all about it. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press do it today. Extra, extra, no, I, I know we're getting off topic, but I'm going to throw it out there and then we'll go back to topic. What a lot of people don't realize is that when Martin Luther King went to jail, even though he was taking pictures with the Kennedys when he got out, it was Richard Nixon who bailed him out of jail. Richard Nixon was vice president of the United States and he basically called yeah. he basically called the county sheriff and the judge and, and he basically told him, he said, he said, you're either just going to release him he said, or the federal government is going to give you so much headache that you're going to wish you did. Yeah. Of course, you don't hear too much about Martin Luther King Jr. By, by, among black activists today because he talked about the content of your character. And that's something that seems to be lost. You know who Ben Jones is, Congressman Ben Jones. He was cooter on the Dukes of Hazard, yeah. And uh, he's been a guest on our show a few times, and, and he actually worked with King. He was one of King's writers. King recruited Mm -hmm. him at the University of North Carolina uh, to work in his organization. And he was a writer uh, with King. And and so he knew King intimately in the last years of King's operation. And he told me that, that if Dr. King were alive today, that Dr. King would be just as appalled at the removal of Confederate flags and monuments as we are. Well, you can't erase history. That's, uh, that's communist. Yeah, the Dukes of Hazard. Now, you remember? Remember the car had the Confederate flag on it? Yes, sir. Remember the, the car, the soup? The, the General Lee? Soup, General Lee had a Confederate flag on it. Uh, <laughs> so, where was the controversy then? This yep. is all political, you know. Well, I can remember when I was a kid going to school that, you know, the big thing to do, because the Dukes of Hazard was on Friday night, so the first thing you did when you got to school Monday was y'all got together and you talked about the Dukes of Hazard and the black kids were talking about it just as much as the white kids were. And well, so, the Confederate flag, that's modeled after the American flag, but slavery began under the American flag and lasted longer. Yep. You know, it's under the American flag. You don't hear about that either. Walk us through. You said you've written five of the six volumes and there are going to be six volumes. Go ahead, individually, volume by volume. Walk us through each of the six books. Well, volume one is about uh, history and bibliography, or histi- historiography. What, it's about uh, 18th century republicanism. What happened to it? Well, what happened to it was the later northern myths. You know, <laughs> so, chapter two is about romanticism in America. Uh, anti the movement against John Locke in the North, the Unitarian religion, anti-biblical, anti-Trinitarian Christianity, and then there's there's uh, a part of that volume two and three are on world history, 1789 to 1848, because what happens in a, in Europe is important to America, particularly the French Revolution. 
French Revolution is crucial, particularly the Jacobins, the Second French Revolution. All the beliefs of later America are there. Democracy, equality, socialism, all there. Second French Revolution, 1792 to 1794. Robespierre and Rousseau. Rousseau influenced the Jacobins. So all those isms in the 19th century North are literally of French origin. By way of Romanticism, and the Romantic writers uh, came to admire the uh, French Revolution. So Romanticism comes to America 1789 you know, to 1848. So can I, can I interrupt you just for a minute? Because I want to run yeah. a theory past you, and I want you to either validate it for me, or I want you to tell me why oh. I'm wrong. Okay. As a pastor, I've preached this. This is in the form of a sermon, uh, but I've, I've never really taken it beyond that. And that is, is that the American Revolution was not really a revolution. It was a revival. And even the war between the states or the war for Southern independence or secession, again, was not a, a revolution. It was a revival. And what they were reviving was the rights of Englishmen, the Magna Carta, uh, the Acts of Settlement. In other words, the basic rights of Englishmen that had been entrenched in the English common law for a thousand yeah. years. And, you know, they were just resurrecting those things or they were reviving those things. And so it wasn't a revolution. It was a revival. But the French Revolution was just that. It was a revolution and it was bloody oh, it and was. it was vicious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that there's a difference. The and as a result, the... the rebellion of the South wasn't a rebellion. But again, it was a oh, revival. Yeah. They were just trying to go back to... Yeah, well... Anyway, the American Revolution and the Constitution are, are, are we're starting our new republic at, at about the time of the f first French Revolution. So our beliefs were from England. You can sum it up as radical Whig ideology, anti-government, freedom from government. Republicanism is literally just no, a, a government without a king. But we have the 13 colonies, self-government, Republican, no monarchy, but republicanism also meant federalism. You have 13 states. you got to have a government. It's got to be federal. So republicanism, 18th century, was radical Whig ideology Americanized. So it's English, English thought, not French. English philosophy versus French. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's one way to put it. Some historians have put it that way. And so that was volume, you said volume two of, of your book, or was that volume three? Well, volume, okay, volume three. Uh, volume four, the War of Independence in Defense of the Rights of Englishmen, as you say. Volume five is about the Articles, about the articles of Confederation through the Federal Convention, called to revise the Articles. But a few nationalists tried to have a coup d'etat, and they wanted a national government. That was rejected by the Great Compromise. So after that, the Federalists, who were not Federalists, defend the Great Compromise. But the Anti-Federalists say that the government was not federal enough. We need states' rights. We need a Bill of Rights. So literally with the Anti-Federalists, we get amendments, both the Bill of Rights and rights reserved to the states. And that creates a whole new federal republic. People forget that. And then the Civil War in the North, you get to the North and what happens 1815 to 1860, the Romantic Revolution. And that's the origins of our Civil War. Hello, I'm Tom Strain, Lieutenant Commander-in-Chief of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Confederate flag, Confederate symbols, and the reputation of our Confederate ancestors has come under attack. The Sons of Confederate Veterans is actively fending off our detractors, but there is only so much that we can do. We need your help. Contact your local, state, and national elected politicians and tell them that you will not tolerate these attacks on our heritage. You can also visit scv.org, download an application to join us in our fight to preserve our Southern heritage. Visit scv.org today. If you don't have a Confederate ancestor and you are tired of American history, 
disappear and you can assist us by becoming a friend of the SCV. Please visit scvheritagedefense.org and make a donation to the Heritage Defense Fund. We hope that you will join us in the fight to defend the Confederate soldier's good name. Your website is www.nullificationhistory.com. Yes. And obviously you chose that name for a reason. And, you know, nullification was one of the big doctrines, if you will, political doctrines, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. that constitutional doctrines that our Southern fathers took very seriously. Explain that and explain how, how you know, secession was basically the ultimate act of nullification. Well, nullification was within the union, within the government. Secession was seceding from, well, from a different union. It's hard to explain. Nullification comes in, and this is from James Madison. James Madison was not the father of the Constitution, and he says this himself in his own notes of debates, but he was the father of nullification. Now, he opposed the Bill of Rights and amendments, particularly the 10th one, preserving rights not delegated to the states. But he led the fight for the Bill of Rights and the 10th Amendment. And then he goes on to explain how that changed the nature of the government and the Union. In opposition to Hamilton, the counter rights of states are mentioned by Jefferson and Madison. The counter rights of states are... The reserve rights, they had the right to protect them. By the reserve rights, the states are the parties to the new government. They are now the judges of that line of partition between general powers and state powers. The anti-federalists are the inventors of modern federalism. Two governments sharing powers. Each one, the states, had uh, a counter... They had a power of self-defense in the form of a negative state interposition to defend their reserve rights and the division between the two governments. This is what Madison says in 1798 and Jefferson, and particularly Madison and the Virginia Report of 1800, has a it's really a, it's really a history of American government from the Revolution. And he maps it out, state interposition, a right to protest uh, the actions of the federal government. Of course, it became a, uh, <laughs> it, it became a, mute, a moot point when, Je- when Jefferson won the election of 1800. So nullification sort of died right there. It okay, was, explain was, to me how nullification died with Jefferson, because I would have thought that Jefferson would have been a champion of nullification. Maybe maybe I miss or or how do I say this? No, 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 maybe no, I'm no, mistaking is, Jefferson's writings with his actions. I I don't know. No 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 no. They were nullifiers. They they were state interpositionists, but they won the election, so they didn't need to follow through on the protest. So the theory was there. The Jeffersonian Republicans did not have to use it, but you have the you have the Constitution. You have the Bill of Rights. You had the Virginia Report still persisting into the early 19th century as a theory, as a right. It's a constitutional right. This is what Calhoun discovers. People forget Calhoun didn't invent it. The key to Calhoun was, and he used the Journal of the, the, Journal of the Federal Convention that Congress reluctantly agreed to publish in 1819. Calhoun gets his information not only from the Kentucky-Virginia Resolutions and the Virginia Report, but from the journal of that federal convention, the notes kept by uh, Secretary William Jackson. So he goes to the original source to get state interposition. The, the opponents call it nullification. Calhoun didn't invent anything. He just repeated original intentions. An- another name you had mentioned as being in opposition to nullification and you know, his being in opposition to James Madison was Alexander Hamilton, of course. Oh, yeah. You know, there's a big Broadway musical right now called Hamilton, and all the liberals just think he was all the rage. So explain to it why why all the liberals are celebrating Hamilton today and why the musical wasn't Madison. 
Well, first of all, Hamilton is portrayed as a black person, so that's ahistorical. Hamilton was uh, was against Republican government. Now, he supported the Federal Convention. He co-authored the Federalists, but he supported the Bill of Rights just so he could get the Constitution ratified. He didn't care about the Bill of Rights. Well, we know this because of the Alien and Sedition Acts later on. He was for a kingly government. He was for a central government, and he tried to he tried to it, he tried to get one through construction of the Constitution, loose construction. Well, it's too hard to amend. Well, we'll just reinterpret it. General welfare clause. So he was going to use construction and language to enlarge the powers of the government. So he was not for original intentions. He tried to get around them. A little known fact of history is that 15 of the Founding Fathers, 15 of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, refused to sign the Constitution. And that's 26%. That's more than a fourth. Of course, yeah. others of the Founding Fathers signed or went along with the Constitution only reluctantly. And so explain why it is that, that the men who were the very founders of the country and the signers of the Declaration of Independence would have been opposed to the Constitution. Well, they would have been opposed to the Constitution. Well, this is this is complicated. They would have they they definitely oppose the Nationalist Plan presented by Madison, Hamilton, James Wilson, and a few others at the beginning of the convention. This was totally rejected. A national government was rejected by the Great Compromise, state representation in the Senate. Now, at this point in time, there were those from the revolution who supported the states and federalism. They were not nationalists, believe me. So they would have they they were opposed to any to any central government. In some fashion, the states had to have a role in the government. So 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 supporters of the Constitution or the plan of government coming out of the convention, most of those were not nationalists or centralists. They didn't want another. They didn't want Great Britain in America. So your latest book is a 156-page work titled "An Inconvenient Truth: A National Government Rejected in the Federal Convention of 1787 and oh, yeah, How It Was yeah. Forgotten by <clears throat> Northern Mythmaking." Yeah, that, that's the introduction to the volume on the period from the Confederation to the Bill of Rights. So that's just the introduction to that volume. And so. Explain how, even in the adoption of a constitution, that nationalist government, if you will, that it was created by the war between the states, ultimately, and Reconstruction, explain, explain how and why that was rejected, even in the adoption of a constitution. The national government proposed by a few nationalists at the beginning of the federal convention was what they call a consolidated government. It would be one single supreme government for all the people, for the people at large, without any state intervention. So it would have been the equivalent of a monarchy. You know, it's what it's what they. <laughs> this, this is why the hell they seceded from Great Britain. You know, a, a central power dictating to the colonies, even the, even the eternal affairs of their colonies. This was rejected. This became a reality with Lincoln and the Republicans by force. You know, so, that's what the war was about. So I want to ask you a question about the historical accuracy of a meme. And the meme is 17, 1789 and the Bill of Rights is being adopted and added to the Constitution. And as these things are being debated, George Washington looks over at James Madison and says, but of course, if everybody starts getting sick, none of this applies, correct? Washington was a nationalist. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. I, I guess what I'm getting at is you look at the situation that the country finds itself in now. Given the Constitution that we have and given the government that was set up by our founding fathers and, you know, even the modifications that were made to it in Reconstruction and, and because of the war between the states, could we have wound up here today without the war between the states? And, you know, how, how did we get to the place where where, you know, the governor just wakes up one day and, you know, basically shuts down his whole state and says, you know, Constitution doesn't apply anymore. 
I right. mean, states' rights but, is yeah. almost being turned on its head and being used against the people right now. But we still have the Bill of Rights and the Tenth Amendment. Now, the Tenth Amendment has been nullified effectively, but not the Bill of Rights. Not the Bill of Rights. Thank God for the anti-federalist. So the Bill of Rights, this is why those people are, in the, are protesting all these draconian laws about you can't go out. You can't, you can't open your business. So they're protesting because of the Bill of Rights. So in, in that case, the Constitution still works. Thank God. Okay. Welcome to the Christendom curriculum. You know, every parent who decides to homeschool wants to secure a great education for their child, while also saving time and money. But these days, many parents have another concern. They also want a homeschool curriculum without all the multiculturalist, politically correct diversity doctrine that's really little more than a thin disguise for an anti-Christian, anti-American, and anti-Western civilization bias. Now there is such a curriculum. The Christendom curriculum gives your children a complete education in Bible, history, literature, and more focusing on the classic academic skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic. But we also tell the story of Christendom, the story of the Christian nations, especially as Christ's kingdom has been historically manifest in the nations of Europe and America. And we do so without apology. The Christendom curriculum is the only Christian nationalist homeschool program you'll find. We support the right of the European and American peoples to their historic Christian cultures against the globalist leftists who want to destroy those cultures. Not only that, but we provide assigned reading courses for various hot-button subjects in our current culture wars, including feminism, social justice, and cultural Marxism, among others. These reading courses will teach your kids how to survive a social justice warrior attack. How to debate with leftists on social media, how to reform their local churches and communities, and more. We're living in a time of tremendous historical and social change. Christians have the opportunity now to begin building the culture and civilization of the next thousand years and beyond. It's an exciting time to be alive. So if you want to help raise the next generation of culture warriors, if you want your children to grow up with a love for Christ's kingdom and for their own nation, while at the same time learning how to defend America and rebuild the West, the easy-to-use Christendom curriculum is for you. Click the Learn More button to get in on the action. And thanks for listening. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I should have asked this question at the beginning of the interview. But you're a retired <laughs> yeah. professor of history at the University of Alabama. Just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and your academic journey and, and, and how you came to be a student and a scholar in these subjects. Well, I was uh, born in Portsmouth, Virginia in 1943. Local high schools, attended the University of Virginia, dropped out for a year in 1964. Attended local Frederick College, got a B.A. degree. Then went to Virginia Tech for a master's in history. I had a, I had a wonderful history professor at Frederick College that got me into history. Uh, so I pursued a master's. Oh, well, then I, the Army called. I was a draftee, 69 to 71, at Fort Gordon in uh, Georgia. From the Army, I went to the Ph.D. program at South Carolina. 1971-1978, got a Ph.D., Jobs were scarce, so I had administrative jobs at the university until I was hired by Alabama State University, not University of Alabama. Alabama State University is a historically black university. So I was there from 86 to 2010, and I taught world history, which was a challenge, but it opened the insights into my book, my magnum opus. You know, that's when I discovered the French Revolution Rousseau and Romanticism, and discovered its roots in America in the pre-Civil War era. So-called Freedom's Ferment, a book by an earlier professor, Alice Felt Tyler. Freedom's Ferment was the Romantic Revolution in America. People forget this. It was something new and different, foreign and alien. 
So basically, beliefs in democracy, equality, nationalism, socialism, feminism, all those isms are not American. They're from Europe. They're imported. And of course, nationalism became the final perfection of America for that period, the Civil War of romantic origins, nationalist origins. Now, before I got on that, I did two-volume study of nullification, nullification of constitutional history. It was constitutional. It was an original intention. Nobody else says so, but there it is. So I, I kind of dug into the archives and the sources. Well, there, there's, there's James Madison supporting nullification, you know, or, or state interposition. So the nullification volumes were kind of the background to my magnum opus now, Beyond Slavery. So you taught for 24 years yeah. at a historically black college. Yeah. And so the greater number of your students would have been black. And no doubt you were yeah. teaching a lot of these things that we've talked about today in the classroom. And so what was yeah. the reaction of your students? Uh, you know, if you were teaching this today, we would be led to believe that, you know, they would have drug you out of your podium and tarred and feathered you in the parking lot. You know, of course, that perception might not even be reality also. But but what were the well, reactions I, you were getting from your students? Well, I got into slavery, but uh, now what I also did, I developed a video based course because by this time you have the history channel, the learning channel. So I said, look, you have all these experts and these documentaries. I said, well, I'm going to start showing those for lectures. You know, I'm going to let the experts say. I had a video-based course. So most of the presentations were literally by experts. But I did get into slavery and northern racism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always like to tell them about Lincoln, you know. So I know that one day I was at a Civil War reenactment. It was a Friday. It was a school day that, you know, the school kids would come on the buses and take a field trip to the reenactment the day before it opened to the public. And there was a lady who was an assistant principal in one of the high schools, and she was very uh, vocal. She was very obstinate. She was very mm -hmm. nasty to me. I handed her a copy of my book, the same one that you read, you know, The Truth About the Confederate Battle Flag. Yeah. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm not in a position to have an argument or a debate with you here. And you've probably already, you know, made up your mind on these things. I said, yeah. but if you want to understand, you know, the other side, <clears throat> here it is in a concise form. You, you can agree with it. You can disagree with it. But at least you'll you'll know where the other side is coming from. I said, you know, you're an academician. You know, obviously you, you can appreciate the, the validity of, of that. And she very belligerently took a copy of the book and, you know, stormed off and took, you know, her group with her. The yeah. next day, sometime Saturday afternoon, this same lady comes to my tent. She finds me. She comes to my tent. And she is in absolute tears. And she's like, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Oh, good. I had different materials. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd hand out you know, book book reviews and book notices, Abraham Lincoln's White Dream or by the, an editor at Ebony or whatever. Mm -hmm. I forget the name of the book. But I always prefaced it by saying, Here's some here's here's something by a scholar. Not just by not just me. Now I also taught the first part of world history. So I loved it when we got to Egypt <laughs> of course. They got the myth of Black Egypt. So I'm showing John Rober's, John Romer's documentaries about Egypt. And he goes down into the tombs, <laughs> some of the burial tombs. And he goes, look, we got white people from the east. And here we have black people from the south, Nubians. So Egyptian was not, e Egyptians were not black. So Nubia was the first black civilization. Of course, they believed that Egyptians were black. Well, I taught them otherwise. But I showed them the evidence, you know, right? Right. The, the tomb paintings. Oh, I loved it, you know. Well, there's so much bad history and myth. I'm it's trying to, to remember his name now. It was Dr. Edward something or other. I can't remember. His, maybe it was Dr. Edward Smith, I, I, if, if I'm correct. I may be wrong about this, but he was a professor 
at American University for a number of years, and mm-hmm. he got away with this because he had tenure, oh, and yeah. also well, because he was black. What he did was he would take his students on walking tours of the nation's capital. Yeah. And he would show them, for example, and the stained yeah. glass windows have since been removed, but like, for example, in the National Cathedral, there was a stained glass window, and he said, and you notice there are some black Confederates in the stained glass window. Oh, yeah. He would take them to a Civil War memorial, and he would say, look at the statue, and look at this, and look at that. Yeah. And he also did a walking tour of Gettysburg with his students, and, and he would show and he would show them. He would say, you see the facial features on, on that uh, Confederate soldier there? He said, mm-hmm. clearly that was a black man. You know, that's oh, not yeah. a white well, man. A white yeah. man wouldn't have that nose. A white man wouldn't have those eyes and, 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 and that jawline and those cheeks and that, uh, yeah. those lips. Well, that, that's true. <laughs> well, now, later on during the Middle Ages, I, get, I, get, I showed, showed them videos of Sir Maurice, a black knight. They love that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a real black knight, you know. But that's and how he shattered black- the, the, you know, they say it's a myth that there were black Confederates. He's like, they were very real. You know, I would often, uh, you know, I would often use that, you know, rather than me being the white guy trying to convince people that they were black Confederates, I would just let the, let the professor from American, the black professor from American University do that teaching for me. I was just, I just got a book here, Mary Lefkowitz. This is a, oh, that's an old book now. Not out of Africa, about Afrocentrism, how it became an excuse to teach myth as history. That's an old book now. Not Greece, but Egypt. Black Egypt. Anyway, the documentaries helped because they knew it just wasn't me, you know. And there was visible evidence of whatever I was saying. So the videos really helped. Of course, you're retired now, so you don't have the burden, if you will, of having to teach in our present, you know, period. But just a few years ago, I found that that you could have discussion and discourse on these things. Now it's as if you can't even have a discussion. Nope, you can't. Well, I read about a black, a burning of a black church in Mississippi in the, I don't know, wasn't, wasn't it's in the early 90s, maybe late 80s. There was no protest about the Confederate flag then, as what happened in Charleston. So this is all orchestrated outrage. The other thing I find interesting is, you know, particularly in Michigan, with the protests that are going on there against the governor, is she keeps going on and on about these Confederate flag waving protesters, and oh, your yeah, CNN but... keeps going on and on, and they don't want us yep. to ever forget that there were protesters with Confederate flags in Michigan. There, there might have been two Confederate flags out of out of five thousand yeah. people. Well, my God, <laughs> people wear the Confederate flag who know nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> they, just, they just like the flag, you know. Yeah. So, so when everybody I, I, has forgotten literally everything yeah. about these protests, the one thing they yeah. will remember is that there were Confederate flags, even yeah. though there weren't. The problem with political correctness is they don't care either. It's anti-history. It's anti-science. It's anti-rational. Was there something that you wanted to discuss today, and I just did not ask you the right question? Uh, the South was right. <laughs> <laughs> end with that. It's a good thing that my conversation with Dr. Wood ended there because we are now out of time for this week's TBR Radio Presents the TBR History Hour, but I do appreciate the fact that you have spent the last hour with us, and I hope that in some way it was edifying and intellectually stimulating. I know I definitely enjoyed the conversation with Dr. Kirk Wood and would like to encourage all of our listeners to go to his website, www.nullificationhistory.com and there's some great material there. In fact, some of uh, Dr. Wood's older books, as well as the uh, advanced copy or the rough draft copy, I guess is a better way to put it, of his current volume six of his uh, book on the causes of the war between the states are available for free on his website in PDF form. You can just download them and read them and it's, it's like taking a college course. It really is. It's just some great uh, scholarly stuff that you can get your hands on. I'd also like to encourage you to go to www.barnesreview.org. Check out the Barnes Review. If you haven't already subscribed or gotten a copy of the May-June issue of TBR Magazine, you'll want to do it on the website as well as check out the bookstore. But like I said, we are out of time. But we will be back again next week. 
And Lord willing, our guest will be Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Kennedy. And I want to say our topic of conversation is going to be the Battle of Berlin. In any event, we will be here next week once again. Same bat time, same bat channel. Until then, from all of us here at TBR Radio, God bless. Talk to you next week.